Hi, I'm Dominic Patton, Senior Editor and Chief TV Critic for Deadline Hollywood, and I'm so glad to be back at Comic-Con this year, especially at Comic-Con at Home. So welcome to our Star Trek Universe panel at this year's San Diego Comic-Con at Home. Now, I'm joined here today by Alex Kurtzman and Heather Caden, who serve as executive producers of the three series that we'll be featuring in today's Star Trek Universe panel, Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Lower Decks, and Star Trek Picard. Hi, Heather and Alex. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, one of the things that we've seen in the past several years is the Star Trek universe is always expanding. So can you tell us a little bit about what's ahead? Absolutely. Well, first of all, Dom, thank you so much for having us. And we're, we're very sad not to be at, at Hall H this year uh, with our Star Trek family in San Diego. But we're really excited that people still get to hear uh, all about it. Let me ask you this. Now, sure. in the past couple of months, we have, of course, heard the great news about Star Trek Strange New Worlds, right. iconic characters coming back with their own series. Give us a sense of where that's at. All right. So uh, obviously, we heard the fans. Uh, I really wanted to tell everybody about it last Comic-Con. Um, people were poking around and asking questions, and we couldn't say anything. But we were already, we were already having real active conversations at that point. Um, the room has started. Um, there are 10 stories broken, which is very exciting. Um, and they're just sort of at the beginning, but it was one of those shows that I think everybody came in with such enthusiasm, so much love. Now, Heather, as we talk about live action Star Trek, and there, are, of course, are several series, and we're going to see many of them today, there's also animated Star Trek coming. Heather, can you give us a sense of what we're going to see in that version of this world? Yeah, so in addition to Lower Decks, which we'll talk about a little later, we're developing a new show for kids on Nickelodeon that the talented Hageman brothers are developing and show running that we're super excited about for kids to have a way into the Star Trek brand. And we're officially announcing today that the title of that show will be Star Trek Prodigy. Boo! <laughs> Now, talking about that, Alex, talking about today, what are we going to see today with, with the Star Trek Universe panel that we have at Comic-Con at home? You are going to see, um, on the Discovery side, a live reading of the finale of season two. Uh, you are then going to have a brief Q&A with the cast afterwards, and then you're going to have a Q&A with the cast of Star Trek Picard. But in between those two, you're going to have... <laughs> A uh, Q&A with Mike McMahon and Lower Deck. So you're going to get to meet the actors and see some artwork and um, enjoy Lower Decks. So you see, guys, even though we're doing Comic-Con at home this year and not doing it in front of your thousands of you in Hall H, we're delivering a full Star Trek package. I want to go back to what we were just talking about again, because, you know, let's be honest, we're doing Comic-Con at home, but we're all living here in this world. And, you know, obviously the coronavirus is keeping us apart from each other this year, but there's a lot of other things going on in this country and around the world. And sometimes I feel like art can speak to some of those issues, perhaps even more than politics can, specifically when we talk about Star Trek, inclusion, diversity, outreach. I wanted to know what you guys think about the message of Star Trek in the America and in the world that we're living in today. I think we're all so proud to be working on a show that has a message that really matters and really resonates. I think anyone who does what they do on this side of the camera, on the other side of the camera is hoping to say something. And I think what's great when you're working on genre is you often get to say things about current events and mask them so they don't feel like medicine or that you're being taught something. And I think in the case of Star Trek, thematically, it's just been baked into what Star Trek is about a better hope, about equality, gender equality, racial equality, sexual equality. I mean, it's, it's what it is. And you know, we've seen in the past few weeks that you guys that we've seen on the Star Trek social media platforms, hashtag Star Trek United. Alex, can you give us a sense about what that is telling us? Star Trek really since its inception has always um, it's endeavored to speak to the vision that we are all fortunate enough to live in every day. It's unfortunately not the vision that the rest of the world <laughs> is living in, but we live in this perfect world where, as Heather said, everybody really is united and, and a lot of the differences that, that are dividing us these days are, are gone. Um, so Star Trek United is, is an effort to bring awareness to many of the organizations that um, are critical right now. Uh, Black Lives Matter, the NAACP, uh, a lot of our cast speaking to that, Star Trek speaking to it. 
Um, the goal is not really to promote Star Trek, but to promote these organizations and to use our platform to be able to bring greater awareness to these very, very important uh, well, messages and places. Well, that's a very worthy use of a very powerful platform. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Alex, for joining us today. Um, thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Now, I am excited to introduce the first portion of the Star Trek Universe panel featuring the season two cast of CBS All Access's Star Trek Discovery, who all came together for a special virtual table read of the first act of the epic season two finale, Such Sweet Sorrow Part Two. So be sure to stick around after this virtual reading because the cast are gonna do a Q&A. And now, without further ado, here is the Star Trek Discovery executive producer and co-showrunner, Michelle Paradise, to kick things off. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michelle Paradise. I am the co-showrunner and one of the executive producers of Star Trek Discovery. And thank you for joining us today as we do a virtual table read of act one of our season two finale, Such Sweet Sorrow Part Two, because it was a two part finale. It was that epic that we had to do it in two parts. Um, and we are so excited that we could come together and do this for Comic-Con since we can't be in there in person. We're very bummed about that, but we are all safely social distancing. Hope you are as well. And uh, we're just excited that we could be here and that we could do this. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are also here to support a very important cause. And for that, I will turn it over to Michael Burnham herself, star of our show, awesome human being, Sonequa Martin-Green. Please tell us uh, the, the extra important reason that we're here today. Yes. Well, that extra important reason is that we're here together today uh, to support an organization known as the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. It is America's premier legal organization fighting for racial justice. It is the country's first and foremost civil and human rights law firm. It was actually founded in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, who subsequently became uh, the first African-American U.S. Supreme Court Justice. Um, the LDF's mission is to achieve racial justice, equality, and an inclusive society. And it's been fighting tirelessly for nearly 80 years in political participation and education, equity, economic justice, and criminal justice reform. So it's really, really an honor to support this organization. We stand by the truth that Black lives matter. This moment and this movement will be forever remembered and change is now. If you would like to get involved by supporting the enduringly impactful NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, please go to naacpldf.org forward slash Star Trek United and donate today. And now, Alatunde will lead us in. Thank you, Sonequa. Appreciate it. Uh, introducing Michelle Yeoh. Hey! Hi! Doug Jones. Hey everyone. Anson Mount. Hello. Anthony Rapp. Hello. Mary Wiseman. Hello there. Wilson <laughs> Cruz. <laughs> What's going on? Alan Van Sprang. Hi. <laughs> Ethan Peck. Hey, how you doing? Mary Tifo. <laughs> Our Discovery Bridge crew, Emily Coots. Hello. Hello. Oyen Oadejo. Hello. Patrick Kwok Chun. Hey. Sarah Midich. Hello. Ronnie Rowe Jr. Hey guys. Back to the remaining cast, Tig Notaro. Here. Rebecca Romaine. Hey, hey. Jane Brooke. Hi. And one more time, Sneekwa Martin Green. Hey, everybody. And unfortunately, Shazad Latif, who plays specialist Ash Tyler, is unable to join us. Uh, so I will be reading his lines today. Um, I'll also be reading the roles of Commander Nan, Yeoman Colt, uh, the nurse, and the doctor. And we have the wonderful Michelle Paradise reading the roles of council member Dr. Tracy Pollard. Tarana, Poe, Lieutenant Amin, Lieutenant Mann, Lieutenant Nicola, and Kavort. Wow. So wow. many lieutenants. Yeah, you got wow. a lot to do. <laughs> so, <many. laughs> so, episode 214, Such Sweet Sorrow, part two. Interior Discovery Bridge. Red alert, whipping from Saru to the con to Oo at her console. Battle stations, report. Weapons armed and ready, sir. And we whip off Obo, making an invisible transition to Interior Enterprise Bridge. Shields at maximum, Captain. 
Transmit to all ships. This is Captain Pike. We have one job. Get Commander Burnham and Discovery through the wormhole. Section 31 is in our way. Interior Discovery loop corridor, steam billowing, crew running every which way. Burnham and Spock take frame. Racing like mad toward engineering. We track with them, almost at full sprint. Discovery will navigate into the clearest possible position. Exterior space, cross cut with Pike on the bridge. As retrofitted shuttles exit the bay, we soar toward the side of Discovery where retrofitted pods launch from dozens of silo openings. Second squadron will match course and speed to cover Burnham's launch and defend her perimeter. And we follow the pods to Enterprise where Starfleet fighter ships are simultaneously launching from the shuttle bay. Enterprise will maintain fire on the fleet to distract them for as long as we can. But as soon as Burnham's detected out there, we have to keep her safe. The Disco and Enterprise ships merge into one fleet, follow as they race alongside and over their respective ship hulls. All shuttles and pods use attack formation Gamma-6. First and third squadrons coordinate positions to disrupt and target the main enemy vessels. This is Starfleet. Get it done. The Starfleeters fan out, forming separate ranks as Section 31 Armada at a distance closes in on all sides. Interior Discovery Bridge Intercut. Mr. Saru, ETA on the suit. Uh, the components are being synthesized and assembled as we speak. Interior Discovery Engineering, chaos. Don't adjust the composite automatically. I'll do it manually before clearing each piece for assembly. I'm not detecting any micro variances. No, I need a surgical spanner, not a standard engineering coupler. Stop, look me in the eye. The silicon injectors have to be purged after each binding is molded. Watch me. The bayonet joint on the oxygen sensors wide open. Are you trying to kill her? It's muscular work, everyone dressed in sweat. A crew member stumbles, drops a piece. Burnham doesn't hesitate. Get off the line. Interior Enterprise, interior discovery, bridges, intercut. High speed, low drag, Commander. The longer it takes her to open the wormhole, the fewer make it home. Yes, sir. What's the intel on how much perimeter space she'll need? Commander Burnham needs to remain at the uttermost radius of the battle at 0 .004 arc seconds. In English, I can't blow a path through what you're saying. Tight enough so none of the Section 31 ships are pulled into the future with her, Loose enough so none of our guys get destroyed by the event horizon. Uh, Lieutenant Spock will remain on comms throughout to guide her. Interior Discovery Engineering, Burnham at the assembly table, snaps open a communicator. Reno, where are you with the time crystal? Interior Discovery Science Lab, Reno stands next to the crystal Faraday cage, off, bracing herself against the console, her face contorted, a future only she can see. Then she hears... Reno! Which jolts Reno back to the moment as she presses on, pushing down whatever it was that she saw. Four minutes, 18 seconds until fully charged. Can you cut that in half? Can I violate the basic laws of physics? No. Interior Discovery Bridge. Commander, we scanned the Section 31 Armada. There's only one life sign, Captain Leland's. The rest of the ships are empty. Drones, nasty ones. Lieutenant Bryce, have you had any success reaching Starfleet? Subspace relays are still down, Commander, attempting to circumvent. Very well then. It is just us. And <clears throat> words of wisdom. Be extremely subtle, even to the point of formlessness. Be extremely mysterious, even to the point of soundlessness. Thereby, you can be the director of the opponent's fate. I'm surprised that a Kelpian of beings has studied Sun Tzu. And I'm surprised a Terran is surprised by anything. She looks at him with increased respect just then. Incoming hail. Leland, sir. That sits. Nervous faces. Saru says to boy them. Now you will see a human face. It is not a human being. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Put it through. On view screen, Leland appears. Leland, we were just talking about you. Everyone hates you. Congratulations. You know I'm here. Give me what I come for or die for it. By authority granted me under the Articles of the Federation and Starfleet Charter, I order you to surrender your vessels. No terms, no deals. Last warning. Transmit the data or you will be destroyed. By my count, we have over 200 vessels while you have 30, is it? A beat? Out again. Exterior space. Three large Section 31 ships release a massive fleet of smaller drones. Peel away from their parent host, Hornets leaving a nest, headed for the Starfleet Armada. Air Discovery, Bridge, pushing on Saru, his eyes focused on the view screen. This is so much worse than anyone was expecting. Interior Enterprise, Bridge, pushing on Pike, eyes on the view screen as well. His voice almost a whisper. Leland, 
wide, the incoming Section 31 Armada approached him, off which, and teaser. Act 1, Interior Discovery Bridge, Officer Scramble, Alarm Scream. Multiple torpedoes locked on us. Evasive pattern, Delta 5. Whip 2, Interior Enterprise Bridge. All power to forward shields, fire full spread. Exterior space, it all happens at once. Enterprise and Discovery launch torpedoes as the Section 31 mothership fires projectiles as the drones fire phasers at the Starfleet fighters. Interior Enterprise Bridge, sparks rain from the ceiling. Damage report. Breach in Section 2, Dex 9 and 10, 7 confirmed dead. Shields at 86%. Interior Discovery Bridge. Shields at 82%. We have a breach on Deck 12, emergency bulkheads engaged. Interior Discovery Engineering, sparks and smoke. The assembly line keeps scrambling to piece together the suit. Backplate complete. He grabs the backplate from the fabricator and rushes it to Burnham. She and Stamets connect it to the suit's empty backport where the crystal will go. Reno, we need that crystal now! Interior Discovery Science Lab, as the crystal glows brighter. One minute away, charge at 98%. Interior Enterprise, bridge, view screen, hundreds of drones engage the Starfleet fighters. All squadrons on those drones immediately. Captain Pike, it's Poe, do you copy? Poe? Pike does a double take, shoots a look to number one. Pull her up. Flying directly under them, like a remora. Number one's fingers fly, enhancing Poe's shuttle on the view screen. Give me your shuttle feed. The view screen bifurcates. Your Highness, who told you you could fly a Federation vessel? First, I invoke diplomatic immunity for stealing this shuttle. Interior Poe's shuttle, intercut. Get out of there. Captain, listen, your squadron's gonna get obliterated. What? I thought these drones looked off key. They have a refracted lattice shield design. You can see it in the wave patterns. They can't be defeated one on one. Attack has to be two at a time, targeting fore and aft emitters simultaneously. Oh, are you certain? I'll put my life on it. A micro beat then? All squadrons, formation double alpha. Team up and begin target acquisition. Follow the queen. Off pose determination and intercut. Hike in number one, exchange a look. Stranger things have happened as. Interior discovery, bridge, the ship is hit. Tilly, Saru, Giorgio, and the crew jolted, but they quickly get back to work as... Mr. Reese, set all phasers for automatic targeting, maximum power and range. Aye, Commander. Owo, bring the emergency generators online. Shields holding at 70%. Leland won't destroy this ship immediately. He'll cripple us and take the data. Then he'll break discovery down for parts. Do you have anything relevant to offer? Invite him aboard. Saru Reese, Giorgio. Whatever you have in mind, this is not a two-pronged mission. First priority is to get Discovery to safety with Commander Burnham. For you, perhaps. You know me well enough by now to know I leave very little to chance, especially when it comes to revenge. That lands on Saru as Reno bursts out of the science lab. Crystal's fully charged. Ensign Tilly, go with her and make sure it gets to Commander Burnham safely. He means in case one of us gets dead along the way. Hurry! I'm going, I'm going, get off my ass. Sir, get off my ass, sir. As they get into the turbo lift. You saw something from the crystal, didn't you? Was it bad? Was I heroic? Did I die? Did you die? Like I said, rinse and repeat. Interior Enterprise Bridge, view screen. The battle rages. Suddenly, all the drones stop. Oh. Pike leans forward, realizing with dread. They're going to make a run at weakening Discovery shields. And indeed, the entire fleet of drones heads for Discovery kamikaze style. Bring us around. Divert all power to starboard deflector shields and place us between the drones and Discovery. Exterior space. Like a swarm, the drones fly into Discovery shields, exploding on impact, row after row, the second line taking point after the first, and so on and so on. Enterprise slots in front of Discovery to take some blows, but the drones swarm around it and keep attacking Discovery. Interior Discovery. Bridge. Another hit. Another. On Owa's console, shields rapidly dropping. Shields down to 54% and dropping fast. Interior Enterprise, bridge. Lieutenant Mann, target the largest 31 vessel and fire it on their shield generators. The entire fleet's receiving signals from Leland inside that ship. Aye, Captain. Interior Discovery Corridor, Tilly and Rena with AI Glove and Time Crystal race to catch up with Burnham, Spock, Stamets, Nan, Nielsen, and the engineers, quickly wheeling the suit on the makeshift table. I need that last panel. Right here. Spock hands him the panel just as the ship is hit. An explosion rocks the corridor, opening a hole in one wall, sending people flying into the opposite wall to the floor. Everyone scrambles to their feet, several engineers wounded, two engineers dead, the time crystal against the wall. Michael. Good. You? Reno? 
a cat. At least five lives left. She gets to her feet as Stamets, back to us, grabs the final panel, stumbles to the makeshift table, slams it into place. We're good. He staggers, turns to reveal a massive piece of metal sticking out of his chest. Oh, Paul. He falls to a knee, bleeding out. Reno quickly hands the AI glove to Burnham as... Take this. She goes to Stamets, who's about to collapse, helps him up. No way you're pulling this dramatic bullshit, Stamets. Get him to sickbay. I'll clean up the mess before anyone gets impaled. Michael. Let's go. He grabs the crystal. She grabs the work table, hurriedly wheels it to the opposite direction. Spock follows Crystal and AI glove in hand as we whip away from them to... Interior Enterprise Bridge, Cornwell. Blood running from a gash in her arm. Shields? Down to 60%. Discovery's at 38. Now their ship will last much longer at this rate. We're not on our heels yet. Keep offensive focus. Make them follow us. Interior, Discovery, sick bay, bio beds full, the wounded spilling out into the hallways. Doctors and nurses run triage. Class four casualties here, class three in the corridor. Cortical stimulation's failing. Any free hands to help us down here? Hey, I need that bio bed. I am sorry, doctor. All personnel on board are occupied. Do your best. Polar disconnects. No, I'm gonna do a half-assed job because now is the perfect time. Interior discovery, shuttle bay. The suit is complete. Whip around to find Spock and Burnham at the Red Angel suit, now standing on its own. Majestic. Are you ready? Burnham stares, a moment of hesitation, off which... It's your mother. And it's you. Trust what you've done together. I do. She stretches out her arms to receive the suit as Spock slams the time crystal in its slot and... The suit instantly responds, forming itself around her. Burnham looks down at herself in the suit. Can't help but belt a little chuckle. Damn. You will be the target out there, Michael. I'll pilot a shuttle to make sure you reach the perimeter point. What are you talking about? You're supposed to guide me by comms. You can't protect me in that. The ship shakes again. There's no time for debate. I will return to Discovery as soon as you open the wormhole. Beat, they just look at each other. Michael doesn't move. I said. I heard you. You better. Falk raises his hand in a Vulcan salute, a beat. She presses her hand to his, together. Another shake breaks the moment. Spock races to the shuttle. Stay in my wake. Burnham nods, touches the side of her helmet. The faceplate closes. Inside the suit, she takes a deep breath, looks out at the raging battle through the shuttle bay opening. Interior Spock's shuttle, shuttle bay, continuous. Spock at the console, firing it up as... Discovery Bridge, this is Lieutenant Spock. Prepare to lower shuttle bay force field and drop aft shields for 3.5 seconds. On my mark. Interior discovery bridge. Understood, Lieutenant. Captain Pike, we are preparing to lower aft shields. Cover fire would be most appreciated. Interior enterprise bridge. Sparks explode from a corner console as... We've got you, Saru. All vessels. We've calculated Commander Burnham will need 2 minutes and 47 seconds to reach safe distance and open the wormhole. Uh, Interior post shuttle continuous. On post, blasting at the drones as... All squadrons form a tactical escort around her on her path and screen enemy fire. I want her in a cocoon until she reaches her destination. On it, Captain. If she doesn't make it, neither do we. Interior discovery, bridge, continuous. Non races back onto the bridge and assumes Tilly station. Lower shields in five. Interior discovery, shuttle bay, same time. Spock shuttle thrusters power up. He flies his shuttle over the top of Burnham. Four, three, two, mark. The shield lowers as Burnham starts running and Spock shuttle soars toward the opening. And as his shuttle flies out, she jumps and exterior space. The Red Angel, Burnham, takes flight. Spock keeps pace ahead of her. And we soar with her through the insane battle. More drones swarming in from all sides as the Federation fighters form a rotating protective cocoon to keep her safe. Many of our ships get blasted and drop away. But other fighters slot right in to keep the perimeter tight. Exterior space with Burnham and Spock. They zip through the battle, protected by the fighters as the drones keep attacking. Interstellar debris density 72% above nominal. Scanning for nominal local coordinates. A blast goes right past her, sending her spinning out of control. Michael. Spinning, spinning, but she writes herself. I'm okay. I got this. She continues moving forward, moving through the debris, as Spock fires back, keeping that path open. Interior, Enterprise, Bridge, Pike, Intense. 
All battle groups form a shield wall against those ships. Keep your protective formations tight. Discovery and Enterprise will take lead. Nobody gets past us until Burnham reaches her target. Exterior space. Our fighters assemble formation into a moving wall as Enterprise and Discovery circle around to form the front line. Everyone firing in literally thousands of directions to keep the Section 31 ships at bay as Interior Discovery Bridge. Commander Saru, sensors are showing something beamed aboard while our shields were down. Before anyone can process, the triple lift doors open. It's Leland, rifle in hand, the bridge in exactly the same configuration as Burnham's premonition. Leland starts firing, blasting consoles. The crew dies from cover as Nan and the two security officers fire back. Leland hits one of the officers who falls dead as he keeps firing, Nan returning fire. Nan keeps firing, but Leland bolts, makes a beeline for the science lab. Everyone stay here. Like hell. Interior Enterprise Bridge. The ship rocks. Pike, Cornwell, and the crew working as? Sir, sensors show Captain Leland beamed aboard Discovery. Pike snaps to his feet. He and Cornwell share a look. We'd have to lower our own shields to beam a team over. Discovery would have to lower theirs. Uh, he looks to the view screen, Discovery taking a beating as Enterprise is hit again. We can't do it, Chris. I know. Interior Discovery, bridge. Saru, the crew, scramble back to their stations as Nan tries to Leland's door. I'll override the security code. Try accessing the lock mechanism directly. Nan pops open a second panel, starts working. How much longer before you gain entrance? Five minutes less if you stop bothering us. Saru pauses, can't help but smile. Then... Commander, shields are at 38%. Hold the line, Lieutenant. After we're done breaking and entering, would you like to help me make Leland scream? Yum, yum. <laughs> Exterior space, the outer edge of the battle. We are at a safe distance, Michael. Stand by. Spock shuttle lands on a massive piece of debris from a destroyed starship. Burnham, falling right behind him, does the same. Exterior space on a piece of starship debris. Burnham catches her breath, Spock in his shuttle, focused. Burnham quickly presses her wrist controller. A large holographic nav screen appears in front of her. Burnham, moving her hands across it, pressing buttons, but her face darkens with confusion. It's not working. The navigation's stuck on the present. It won't move forward. Exterior space, closer to the battle. The Section 31 mothership launches the photon torpedo at Enterprise. We follow it as it impacts but lodges in the hole near the bridge. Half in the ship, half out, exactly as in Burnham's premonition. Interior Enterprise continuous. The ship starts to list, everyone holding on. Number one shouts against sparks and groaning metal. Captain, an undetonated photon torpedo has breached the hull. If it blows, it'll rip a hole four decks wide in the saucer section. As that lands, exterior space on a piece of starship debris, Burnham sees Enterprise listing and zooms in for HUD. HUD POV, the undetonated torpedo lodged in the hole. Spock. Everything I saw. This is how it starts. Off which, end of act one. And now I will be handing things off to EP and co-showrunner, Michelle Paradise, who will be moderating our cast and Q&A today. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tuesday. Um, so uh, these are questions that have been submitted uh, for all of you. This one's actually for me, but I'm curious how any of you might respond. Um, how important is it to you to continue the tradition of Star Trek, uh, taking a social and political stance as you enter season three? Uh, <laughs> I it's love everything. Uh, it's so like eager. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it's everything. I mean, Star Trek, of course, is, is you know, it's fiction, it's science fiction, but it, it's always meant to imagine a future and a world in which people uh, are, are valued for who they are, the content of their character, not, not the color of their skin, not their gender, not their gender expression, not their age. Um, and, the, you know, in this explosive time, it seems more resonant now than ever that we help sh shine a light on all of those issues. And it's not always doing it like, it's not shining a light like super vividly all the time. It's just, it's part of the fabric of it. And that by itself is, is leading the way, I think. I think what I'm grateful for um, is the fact that Star Trek has always been this um, aspiration for, for our society, for our country, that it has always set a goal 
um, and that it's been our job to help a mat to help not only imagine that future but to create it. And so I think going into season three, um, we have an opportunity to really have a conversation about the world that we want to create and how each of us has a responsibility to to create it together. So um, I'm grateful for the history that Star Trek has um, created in, in terms of giving us something to aspire to. And so I hope that we continue that with season three. Something I'm seeing. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, go on, I'm Mary. not going to interrupt Michelle Yeo. Please go. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that note, I shall leave. <laughs> I just want to say that tradition is just part of our DNA. And we just have to continue to strive together for what we believe in, for what is right. We know what is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And we have to do it together. Yes. And that's I'm pretty much continuing that, just striving and something that I've been really been thinking about. My gratitude uh, for being a part of this franchise is that it's about the infinite combinations of diversity, that our work is never done, that there's still uh, representation and visibility yet to be seen. And so I'm really grateful to be a part of a franchise that champions that over and over again. And the work isn't done, but it's pretty exciting. I think that one thing I value about specifically our version of Star Trek is that we don't make assumptions that we've already reached perfection, that we allow that there's more to do within ourselves and within the utopia of the Federation and beyond. And I think that's a really important message to hear right now because there are a lot of people who assume some of these issues are solved and they're not. So I love that about our show and I think um, it's important. It's taught me a lot about how to engage in my reality at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Mary. I wanna piggyback and say that I, I think a story like this, speaking of, or piggybacking on what everyone has said, a, a story like this, that can, um, that can give us an example of what that future might look like. I think it, uh, at least I hope that it um, really holds us accountable um, and shows us as Mary was just saying that, um, as both Marys were saying that the work is not done and that it's about confronting, confronting ourselves and really confronting each other. And we see that in this story um, within the legacy of this, of, this, uh, of this franchise. So that's really what's gonna propel us forward is confronting ourselves truthfully and confronting each other, exposing ourselves in a way like we haven't before. Um, so I hope that we contribute um, in our iteration. I hope that we contribute uh, moments to the movement in that way. Um, um. Tunde, this question is, uh, is for you. Uh, can you describe a moment or a scene that was especially rewarding for you as a director when you directed the finale? Oh, boy, that's a <laughs> tough one to uh, pick from. Um, I would say the final scene of the episode. I would say we know that Burnham uh, has uh, gone to the future and Spock walks out. And we walk out onto the bridge of the Enterprise, and he's no longer got a beard. And uh, he walks up to the front, thinks about his sister, and uh, then uh, goes to a station for the first time um, since we've been seeing the Enterprise bridge. For me, that was just uh, emotionally cathartic and kind of brought the whole season um, uh, down to that one moment and reinserted us back into... Uh, the timeline that we know and love from uh, Star Trek. That was pretty awesome. And the sound. The sound and of the, <laughs> the thing. Yes, the sound of the thing. The <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> um, and well, I kept the... Ethan's beard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I painted it a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I tried, it didn't work. Um, uh, Sonequa, so this takes us into a question for you. Uh, as Burnham uh, leaps ahead into the future at the end of season two, um, what would you say is her hope, not just for Starfleet, but for herself moving forward? Oh my goodness. Um, well, first, I mean, you know, a salvation of, of, of sorts. Uh, you know, we are, um, we the crew of Star Trek Discovery in the finale are deciding to to sacrifice everything everything that we have for the future and so there's the obvious hope that that works 
<laughs> that the plan works. Uh, and even logistically that we land where we're supposed to, that we defeat control, that we save the world and save the universe. So there's the inherent hope of that. And then I think there's also a hope of continuing to discover myself um, as Burnham. That'll, that'll always be there. Um, that hope of um, unveiling, continual unveiling uh, mm -hmm. and finding that perfect, sweet, sweet balance um, between um, all the forces that, that, you know, wage within me. <laughs> Maybe you'll explore that in season three. We don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, Doug, this one's for you. Um, so in season two, take your brain back, uh, Saru reunited with Serana and also helped to free his people and push them into becoming a, a warp capable society. Um, how hard do you think it was for Saru to leave them behind? And without giving away any spoilers, do you think there's a future for more Kelpians uh, in the Federation? Uh, oh, right. I think that's the hardest thing Saru has ever had to do. And he's now had to leave his home world and his sister twice. Uh, uh, as we look back at the, uh, the shorts that show my background with how, I, how Saru joined Starfleet, uh, he had to make a decision to leave his home world with the promise that he would never return. That's, that was the hardest decision he ever had to make. Then we come back to Kaminar in season two to uh, discover with, with this new found information that, that uh, my, my people have been oppressed by the Ba'ul this entire time and lying to us about our own evolution. And, uh, and he, he really, uh, that's when I, when Saru faces off with uh, Captain Pike uh, with his newfound fearlessness uh, to say, no, I, I need to go back. I know I promised not to, but this is, this is my job to do. Uh, so after liberating his people and feeling, you know, great about, about the future that the, the Kelpians can have now, living in peace with the Ba'ul, it was a peaceful uh, uh, resolve. Um, and now they can, they can absorb each other's uh, 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 cultures and technology. Uh, He's made, now he's made the decision to, go, to follow uh, Burnham through the wormhole uh, with the crew and go into the future and have to leave everything behind once again. But in those final moments, he sees that his sister Serana is now piloting a fighter ship and is like, I guess it worked. I guess, I guess <laughs> the Kelpians have joined the, the, uh, the, the post-warp society and he feels good about that. And I think, I think yes, with, with every hope jumping ahead that, that Kelpians will have a place at the table in the Federation for sure. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned uh, jumping ahead into the future and him having to leave everything behind. This leads us nicely into a question for Michelle. Um, so by the end of season two, giorgio has been ripped away from the world that she knows, not just once, but twice. <laughs> she just keeps getting Thank you. Away from I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, she was the leader of the mirror universe. Not anymore. And now she's a, a, an agent of the section 31. Nope. Now you're going to the future. Um, at this point, where would you say Giorgio is going into season three? Is she along for the ride? Does she want to seek power? Uh, where is she emotionally going into season three? Into season three? I think she's really pissed off. <laughs> it's like, Michael Burnham, don't get in my way. <laughs> no, I think she, but you know, uh, Emperor Giorgio, Captain Giorgio, she is one that always finds her way uh, into adapting because she is a survivor with many skills and a formidable ally or an enemy. So she goes in there being very pissed off, but then I'm sure very quickly she'll find a way around. And power is something that's inherently that she has. She doesn't even seek it. She just has it. <laughs> Awesome. Mm, scary, huh? Watch yeah. out, <laughs> I wonder what's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> Anthony and Wilson, um, at the end of the season two finale, Stamets and Culver reunite as a couple. Um, can you, without giving any spoilers away, talk about how they'll continue to heal and grow their relationship moving forward? To me, one of the great things about season three is it really blends the personal slash family nature of our show and not just literal family like our couple, but also the family of the ship it, and, you know, it, it really explores family in wonderful new ways. So um, I think that's one of the cool things and trying to find a way to say it without spoiling too much, but that's one of the major things that gets developed in season three for sure. Um, I think what's great about season three is that because of the way season two ends, um, the fact that Culber has made a choice, he's, he's taken a risk uh, without knowing what 
it's going to happen. He chooses to stay on um, the discovery. And, um, and because of that choice, uh, he gets to save his life, uh, Paul's life. And I think in that moment, he realizes that everything he has ever wanted and everything that he needs is right here between these two people. Um, Took him long and, enough. Yeah, well, <laughs> you don't necessarily make it easy. Um, don't get me started. We're going to fight that fight again. Uh, <laughs> but um, but uh, my point is that, what was my point? My point is that because he's made this choice, um, he, he knows that he's different. He knows that he's looking at his work different. He knows that he feels different about his place in the world and what his purpose is. Um, and so the relationship is different in that way too. Um, it's more on an equal footing, I think. And, um, and I'm excited about the new responsibility that, that I take on uh, in terms of my work and mental health. And um, I love the new Culber. He's uh, more three-dimensional in my head. Awesome. Uh, I'll tell the writers. Um, <laughs> this next one, uh, Mary Wiseman. Since the, since the start of the series, Tilly's always had her eye on the captain's chair. Um, with all that's happened with the Discovery crew over the past two seasons, um, by the end of season two, is she still on that path? I think so. I think there are some uh, pretty big speed bumps in season two on that, on that road, but um, I think that's always her pie in the sky, is, is reaching sort of the zenith of leadership within Starfleet. And um, you'll get to see more about that journey in season three, but um, we're also really on the edge of the unknown. So I think all of our ideas about what the future holds and who we are and who we want to be are gonna be transformed. Yeah. Let's take it to uh, Anson and Ethan and Rebecca. Uh, any of you, all of you, please dive in. Um, the, the Enterprise crew are the ones who were uh, left behind in the pre-TOS era. Um, how do you think that working with the Discovery crew has impacted and will continue to impact your characters as they continue exploring strange new worlds? See how we just did that there? Strange, get, okay. Someone wrote that for me. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll start by saying that Spock's interaction with Michael Burnham is essential to transforming Spock from somebody who's been born on Vulcan that is half human, that has been taught to be Vulcan. And I think Michael Burnham gives him the permission to be human and teaches him what it is to be human. And so that is, you know, essential to the development of Spock uh, as we uh, follow along it between uh, the conflict between his emotion and logic going forward into when we first see Leonard Nimoy in the original series. So it's a huge character point for me and will dictate a lot of behavior for Spock because of his interaction with Michael. So I think that's most important for Spock. Anson or Rebecca? Captain Pike? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the biggest thing, obviously, uh, was seeing my, my, my future. And when you see how it's all going to end and... Uh, that it's not so pretty, you know, what do you do with that? I think there's a reason that we can only see our past because uh, we're a very neurotic species and uh, <laughs> we wouldn't know how to, to comport ourselves. And so I think ultimately the question comes, how do you move forward? And then uh, how, I think he's probably going to wrestle with how uh, he can best utilize the rest of his life for the good of the world, the universe. And I think a lot of it is also surrendering to the unknown, you know, together, um, working as a team to surrender to the unknown, I think. Um, and that's, a, that's probably a very important point. He's, <laughs> he's probably not, he's not thinking about it as a team yet because he's, he's wrestling with it himself, which I, I, hope, I hope he's going to learn to wrestle, let other people help him wrestle with it. Cool. Um, awesome. Well, uh, those those were the questions uh that uh were submitted to me um thank you everyone for joining um it was fun it was great and by the way if you noticed uh differences between what you saw on screen and what you heard today uh that is the magic of editing there you go if you would like to watch the full table read of star trek discovery season two finale such sweet sorrow part two <laughs> then you can do that tomorrow at the below Exciting. thank you thank you bye, bye.
Ah, what a great cast and what a great season finale. Now, as Sonequa mentioned, please be sure to catch the full virtual table read of Such Sweet Sorrow Part 2 tomorrow on CBS.com. You can also see it on Star Trek social media platforms as well. Up next, everyone is in for a very special treat as we enter a new level of the Star Trek universe with the upcoming animated comedy series, Star Trek Lower Decks. So now, please join me in welcoming Star Trek Lower Decks showrunner and executive producer, Mike McMahon. Hey, uh, welcome to the Star Trek Lower Decks portion of San Diego Comic-Con at home. Uh, I'm Mike McMahon, I'm the creator and EP of Star Trek Lower Decks. And I'm so proud to be a part of this Star Trek family with all this stuff you guys are seeing. You know, what you're about to see is people talking about a show that takes place in 2380. It's in the TNG era. It, it's right after the events of Star Trek um, Nemesis, uh, but it's before, way before the events of Star Trek Picard. You know, the TNG era is what I feel most comfortable in. Today, we're going to be joined by the, the voice talent of Lower Decks so that they can talk to you as well about what it feels like to be in a Star Trek and, and to tell you a little bit about the show. And to start off with, we'll be showing you a clip of a scene from the first episode that just gives you a little bit of a taste of what the show feels and looks like. We tried to fit it into canon so that it doesn't break anything, but we tried to do something new with it at the same time. We tried to keep it exciting, but we also tried to keep all of the ethical sci-fi sort of stuff that makes Star Trek Star Trek without breaking it. And I think we've come up with something that a lot of people are gonna, are gonna really enjoy. So just to start off, let's watch this clip and then we will introduce the voice talent of Star Trek Lower Decks. Captain's Log, Stardate 57436.2. The Cerritos is docked at Douglas Station for routine maintenance and resupply. We will soon set course for the capital planet on the Galar system where we're scheduled to make second contact with the Galardonian High Council. First contact is a delicate, high-stakes operation of diplomacy. One must be ready for anything when humanity is interacting with an alien race for the first time. But we don't do that. Our specialty is second contact. Still pretty important. We get all the paperwork signed, make sure we're spelling the name of the planet right, get to know all the good places to eat. <gasps> Oh my god, what are you doing? Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh just... no, oh no, 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 no! Are you pretending to do a captain's log? <laughs> We're all supposed to keep logs. Okay, let me listen to no, it. No, go away. <laughs> I can't believe you're no, wasting no. your shore leave on this. Privacy, please. Okay, time to go. Come on, get out of the closet. Let's go. Come on. Are you drunk? Yeah, dude, you should be too. I mean, this station is amazing. And they have Romulan whiskey. And I bet you thought it was going to be green, but it is actually blue. It's this very beautiful color. Romulan whiskey is against regulation. Yeah, because it's awesome. Oh, man, they got all sorts of great stuff. Oh, oh, oh come on, check this out. Ah, be oh, careful yeah. with that. Pretty sweet, right? Yeah, it's a Klingon bat. Um, bat, uh, bat. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. It doesn't matter. Shut up. I got it from an old guy with an hey, iPad. Hey. Come spar with no, me. Stop. Come on. Oh, we can be Klingons. We can have crimped hey, hair, hey, wrinkled hey, foreheads. It's war, got war, war. On it. I love honor. Hey. I demand honor! Listen, I promise you, people do not get chopped in the leg by a bat left every episode, but it is always a possibility when you're serving on a Starfleet ship. All right, now let's meet some of our voice talent from Star Trek Lower Decks. Tani Newsom. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. I can feel the virtual throngs of people crushing my body as I push through the crowd. Hey, Jack Quaid. Hey. Thanks for joining us. Eugene Cordero, I'm glad we got to do this. This is cool. Me too, me too. All right, so we have Noelle Wells here. Hi. Don Lewis. I wish I could see you in person, but we will we'll be together again soon, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to it. Jerry O'Connell, thank you for joining us uh, from what appears to be a beautiful verdant hill. It's just, no, it's a, it's a green screen. I'm actually in my basement. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so, so am I. Hey, Fred. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Jillian Vigman, thank you for joining us. Ah, oh, it is my pleasure to be here, Mike. So there are all kinds of officers in Starfleet. There's engineers, there's scientists, and there's all sorts of different commanders. And then even in those ranks, uh, uh, you know, you never know what you're going to get. What kind of Starfleet officer is your character? I have joked before that she's not very different from me. And that is a testament to um, you, Mike, for um, liking my personality, I guess, and just kind of writing it into a cool Starfleet officer. Um, but yeah, you know, she's a little um, 
I don't know. She doesn't always play by the rules, even though she could because she's good at things. It's kind of like, you know, when you're the when you're the class clown because you are ahead of the lesson in school type of a thing. A lot about Star Trek is about the humanity in, in the characters that are on the ship. Like they can be spouting all this technological stuff, but you really care. You want to care about the characters and and you really make that character fun. Thanks, man. It's a team effort. Yeah, uh, Ensign Brad Boimler is uh, the ultimate Starfleet nerd. He's like a, a complete uh, fanboy for all the captains and the first officers, basically anyone who works on the bridge. And he wants to be like them so bad that he is obsessed with rank and ranking up. And he figures the best way to do that is to go as by the book as possible. So he follows every Starfleet rule to a T. Uh, he has no demerits uh, at all. He uh, logs even when he's really not supposed to because he's an ensign. See me, but he means well. so well. And honestly, it's just it's just like a guy talking to his <laughs> friends that are giving him a lot of uh, guff. I like that Tawny calls you Boimler, or she calls you Boims on Twitter. It's so cute. Ensign Tindy is like the fresh eyes on the Cerritos, she's excited by everything. Nothing. She's unflappable. Even if the there's weird things happening, she somehow turns it into this optimistic point of view. Um, so she's she's just very excited. Ensign Rutherford is the cyborg, but I mean, I guess he loves the fact that he is half mechanics because he loves the mechanics. He's an engineer guy. He's uh, he's all about the tech talk. He's the guy you want on your trivia team talking about, you know, every, every single ship that's ever been in the galaxy or beyond. Yeah. So Dr. Tana, who is, I would say she's the head medical officer on the Cerritos. And because of that, she has an extreme responsibility to take care of basically everybody on board. Dr. Tana, she might be great at solving space medical mysteries, but she's also a scary, crusty alley cat, which is how, why we love her. Dr. Tana <laughs> may have the gruffest bedside manner, but she loves to dig in and get to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Shax, uh, yes. what kind of Starfleet officer is he? Well, he is a definite uh, shoot first, ask questions later. He is no nonsense. He is a Bajoran that's got a chip on his shoulder, as he should. He's hardcore, but in some ways terrible for security because he's just like, Oh, uh, someone's hailing? Fire! We should, I suggest we hail fire on them, you know, and it's like, and, you know, but at the same time, he, uh, he kicks ass and he, uh, he gets the job done. My character, Ransom, as a number one, has a pretty short fuse. Um, he's, uh, I don't think he's the easiest person to work for, um, but he does, uh, he does deeply care about Starfleet. He, he just does and says things that I'm not sure we could get away with on other Star Trek franchises. Since we're the first comedy Star Trek, we figured like, we're not on the most important ship in the fleet, so why not have them really be people? Because Star Trek is always about oh, you know, people who are out Oh, there. easy. The Cerritos is super important to Starfleet. Come on now. <laughs> Everybody right. knows that. All right, I'm sorry, I know. And you know, it's funny, as the captain, I never feel confident and I never feel in command. I always feel like I'm talking <laughs> for talk's sake and people are just gonna do whatever they're gonna do anyway. But uh, I take myself very, very seriously. Captain Freeman is, is vital, she's important, and she is in control and in charge. And the Cerritos in our mission to do second contact, which is almost more important than first, contact because first contact, <laughs> no one knows you're there. Second contact, we make sure things are running smoothly, things are running right, and Captain Freeman, she's in charge. And she's gonna make sure everybody knows that she's in charge. Whoa, okay? listen. All right, all right. I, I shouldn't I shouldn't <laughs> have made it sound like you guys weren't the most important, you know, the unsung heroes are still heroes. Thank you. So fans of Star Trek have always dreamed about serving on a Starfleet ship. And now you kind of have done that through your character. What would you say is one of the most fun things about serving on a Starfleet ship? I would, I think I would be a bit more of a nerd even than Mariner. And I think I'd be really focused on ascending rank because I just would want to get to that sweet, sweet bridge. I don't need to be the captain, but I just want to be, you know, I just want to be someone on the bridge who's in charge of something like medium important because I want like enough responsibility so that I can have an ego 
but not enough to where if something crashes or burns or, or people die, it's my fault. I'd say maybe the most fun thing would probably be the holodeck. And I know we got a lot of cool mileage out of that during our, our season. Well, we did, but people don't know yet. But oh. I guess this is a, this is a, a Jack Quaid has promised oh. fans you'll be seeing some stuff happen on the holodeck. It's fine. Where else would we tell them? The leaks are real. <laughs> <laughs> but now they know we turned it on. Huge drops for Comic-Con. It's crazy. Uh, and it works. What? Whoa. Most of the time. Hey, yeah. so was there a moment season one that you loved that you think you can tell the San Diego at-home Comic-Coners today? My favorite thing that Rutherford does is when uh, the and all of that and it was just going and try and couldn't get it quite right for what was happening. Mariner, who was always such a screw up, always trying to undermine me and try to see what she can get away with. I am constantly, as Captain Friedman, trying to come up with ways to get her back in line. And I realized the most fun episode for me was that episode where I came up with this plan. You know what? Instead of continuing to cut her off at the knees, promote her. That's the last thing she wants to do is work. There are many, and I don't want to blow too much of it. I just love how he just comes in at full force, no matter what. You're too loud. Captain says you're too loud. Breaking instruments. Stop me if I'm giving up, giving away too much about this episode, but there's an episode where uh, we meet uh, Boimler's girlfriend. And that was maybe my favorite episode to record because this guy in, in any kind of romantic scenario is just hilarious to me. But this is really a whole cast. This is an all skate. Um, I love episode eight so much. It is maybe, I don't want to pick favorites, but it really grabbed all the things that I love about Trek and then all the absurdity that you've injected into this world with what happens at the end. This is the greatest thing I could be a part of. One, you guys let me be crusty, curmudgeon bitter, and yet filled with sort of this excitement for and curiosity for learning. My favorite part of the first season, I would say, is when Ransom uh, gets into a pretty vicious fight with uh, it's, uh It's pretty gory. It's not for the faint of heart. You have a very unique situation in your household because the last time I checked, usually there's not two number one second in commands right. in under one roof. So I play Ransom in uh, the, the number one in uh, Lower Decks. My wife is the number one on the recently announced Strange New World. So my wife is a number one. We're also very, very good friends with Jonathan Frakes, who's also oh. number one. So, man, when the three of us get together, I just, I mean, I, 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 really, should, I really should live stream it for everybody. What would be your pitch for people who, who are, you know, maybe aren't Trekkies? Do you think that people who aren't Trekkies are going to like Lower Decks? Yeah, I think that that's what's so great about the show. Obviously, it's going to be exciting for people that are Trekkies, but the show is... Um, a totally different perspective and has this comedic bent that we haven't seen before. So if you are into animation, if you like dark comedic comedies, um, there's enough, there's plenty for everybody. <laughs> I think you're right. I think that people who like Trek will find a lot to love in this and people who have never seen Star Trek, it might be the first thing that makes them go, wait, maybe I like Star Trek. All right, and that's it. Thank you everybody for joining us uh, and letting us talk to you about Star Trek Lower Decks. Uh, we can't wait for you to see the season, which again premieres on CBS All Access on August 6th. Um, and just personally, uh, I know this is tough times and I know that we're all looking for a way to kind of get through it. And I know that we can just hang in there, take care of each other and watch as many cartoons as possible. Thank you everybody. Live long and prosper. And now I want you to get in that car and I want to see you do a flip right over that hill. <laughs> Careful, Watch no. this. Oh God, Jerry, no! <laughs> well, look, I'm a big Star Trek fan and I got to tell you, I am definitely excited to see Lower Deck soon. 
Now, last, but for me, surely not least, we round out this year's Star Trek Universe panel with the cast of Star Trek Picard. So please join me as I moderated a portion of this panel as we catch up with Sir Patrick Stewart and the rest of the Picard crew. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, Comic-Con at Home panel, Star Trek, the entire Star Trek franchise, but it is my supreme pleasure to welcome the Star Trek Picard cast. If you don't mind, please, your digital applause, Alison Pill, Issa Briance, Evan Evergora, Michelle Hurd, Santiago Cabrera, Brent Spiner, Jonathan Del Arco, Jonathan Frakes, Jerry Ryan, Marina Sirtis, and Jean-Luc Picard himself, <laughs> Sir Patrick Stewart. Thank you so much. All of you. So this is obviously a bit of a reunion for, for most of us as we did this last year in Comic-Con in person at Hall H. Guys, since then, the show has debuted. It's been a massive success. Obviously, you're going to be back for a season two. Sir Patrick, I wanted to ask you before we started, how has it felt bringing the show back to people and what's been the kind of response you've had from the fans? Well, we haven't brought it back. It, it actually never went away. Mm. And um, it, it was at first very challenging because um, thanks to our brilliant team of writers, we're living in a very different world, very complex world, profoundly troubled world, which might just be appropriate for the times that we're living in as well. For me, however, it was a case of, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Uh, you, you are who and you're playing what? Because we had a, a brand new team. So for me, a lot of the first half of the first season was literally about getting to know the people that I was working with. Learning their names, I think you mean to say, Patrick. It took you the first yeah. half of the season to learn their names. Well, I, I, I learned their first names. I still don't know most of their, their second names. names. I know, but we, 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 we allow for that because you're very old. <laughs> not, not yet, but about to be. <laughs> Alison, I wanted to ask you, this seems a very different sort of show from what we've seen you do before. What attracted you to doing Picard? Uh, I guess SPS over there was somewhat of a draw. Ugh, don't let them know I said that. Um, <laughs> that's you, Patrick. You're SPS. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, the first S is your knighthood, dude. Oh, um, <laughs> the other reason is Michael Shabon, too, who's one mm. of my favorite novelists, and having a showrunner coming from who both appreciates the you know the whole the whole idea of both appreciating star trek and trying to take it into a new direction that's you know it's it's streaming we get to use the f word like that combination was very exciting to me of sort of <laughs> amplifying the things that worked and and taking it in new directions at the same time i want to give a special shout out to evan who is joining us from australia today so Yay. in the middle of the night going for doing double duty and to that, Isa and Evan, this was really your first U.S. major television role. What were some of the things that you found as challenges and what were some of the surprises that you both had working on Picard? I think meeting everyone um, initially, I was terrified. I think, Patrick, I don't even know if you remember our first meeting, but you introduced yourself and I just said, good thanks. I don't even say, you just said, hi, hi, I'm Patrick. I'm like, yep, good, thanks. Yeah, so <laughs> it, took me, it took me, I think, a day to get over that that entire embarrassment but then the cast and everyone jonathan um directed my first episode they just made everything so easy and comfortable it's never been really like hard or difficult it's just been fun since the beginning mm. uh, and you i reckon Asa feels you the same way you you obviously played multiple roles in this season um what was that like for you in, in terms of, of finding your your place as an actor working against some of these actors working against some so <laughs> <laughs> Where, um, I have to say, the, the vibe here is confrontational. Yes. Um, the way that it unraveled was, was very gradual, so it didn't feel like a total shock to the system because um, as I was auditioning, I didn't realize I was auditioning for multiple characters and then eventually found out they were twins and then, then one of them is gone <laughs> pretty quickly. So I was like, all right, well, this is your usual plan, your, your one role, but then... Sutra came in later and I think the fact that I had so much of the beginning filming process to just lock in 
Soji and who she was was amazing mm -hmm. because then Sutra came later and I already knew who Soji was. So I got to take Sutra. It was just the, completely just the gold character. paint and the switching yeah. back and forth that and the like that that was the doing off of camera that. for yourself that, that and is, oh yeah. my Lord. Very impressive yeah. though. You, you handled well, that like well, a pro. Yes, I was losing my mind a bit. Um, looked a little crazy just turning my head and talking to myself. But yeah, it, it was very definitely impressive. cool. And, and coming from theater as well, I think I thought I think I thought it was going to be more different than it was. It's really, you know, your character was... Rafi is really gives us a real sense of the time that has passed between the last time we saw Jean Luc, I guess, in 2002's Nemesis movie, and now, oh, 20 years. And it gives a story of what has happened in those 20 years. For you uh, and Patrick, um, how did you work as actors in finding those characters and creating that backstory within a backstory, so to speak? That's a testament to the script that's right there and the, um, you know, my amazing scene partner. Um, I, like the rest of us, you know, first meeting um, SPS, it, it's pretty, you know, it's, um, it's intimidating. I have a terrible um, feeling. Oh, Pashal, stop it. Just stop it all, you guys. It's going to be unbearable. But all this to stop say... It. All this to say that all the people out there who, you know, think of, of uh, Patrick Stewart in this sort of iconic um, um, world, which we all pl place him in, the truth is he's one of the most generous, human, empathetic um, individuals <sighs> I've had the honor to work with. Um, and it was just, I mean, like... Marina's so, just not having this. <laughs> you lot, you Picard lot. It took us years to train him. Santiago, you're, you're the space cowboy, my man. And it, it's a very different role in the sense of you, uh, how your character plays a foil to Jean-Luc. What was that like for you? Um, can you repeat the question? Yes, I can. Um, <laughs> your character is, is really the space cowboy of season one. Um, and you come on and, and you... You're I think I had lost foil. you at space cowboy. That's why I... That's <laughs> right. You were like, clearly <laughs> that's, <laughs> not, that's yeah. not me. I think Who's I lost that? Yeah, um, yeah, you're, right. you're, you know, he's such a foil to, to Jean-Luc's rigid and strict and, and, and by the book way of doing things for the most part. What was that like for you in bringing that character to the series and, and, and the development between the two as it went through? Because clearly we're gonna see more in season two. Well, I think you know, it was like discovering it as you go along as well. And that sort of how different they were, you start to realize the similarities as well, not just the, the background of being from Starfleet, you know, uh, um, that kind of similar background. But that at the end of the day, I think what was interesting from Rios is that he sees him for the man he is and kind of, at the beginning, he rejects him for being the embodiment of Starfleet, but then as the season goes along, he starts to see the real man. Jerry, Brent, it, it seems pretty clear we're going to see some more of you guys. It was a huge reaction last year when you guys stepped on stage at Comic-Con. What have, kind of reaction have you received from fans since you actually appeared on Picard? It's been amazing, and um, the fan reaction has been kind of overwhelming, and uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's fun to bring back these, these characters that we played so long ago, and I could not be more thrilled with the way they've developed her. Brent, <laughs> obviously you appear here in, as not only Data, but in a whole new role. What was that like for you? I'm sorry, I lost you at Space Cowboy. <laughs> 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 Playing another character aside from Data, is that what we were talking about? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it, well, it was terrific. It was part of what really encouraged me to do the show. I mean, I, I had sort of, put Data to sleep or, or blew him up or something and uh, didn't really expect to ever be doing that again. Uh, and then I met with uh, uh, Alex and Akiva and uh, Michael and um, they, well, they wept. They actually cried begging <laughs> me to come uh, do it. And uh, like, was that real tears or was that Android tears? <laughs> Well, I, I think it was real. real. I, and, Those are real. And then I heard about this. Yeah. I, but yeah. then I spoke to Patrick about it, and uh, and and he wept. So I thought, <laughs> well, uh, of course I, I must do that. <laughs> Marina and Jonathan, um, you're back. There's pizza. There's a happy life. What was that like being back on set? Johnny, did you think that we'd ever um, be back in space? I didn't. I didn't think I'd be back in space. I was just happy, to be honest, that I didn't have to wear the space suit. Yeah. So Very practical. <laughs> because it was like, I wouldn't fit in it anymore. So that would be an issue. Um, but it was lovely. It was really mm. lovely. Johnny, uh, over to you. Yeah. I had just directed SPS. I can't believe we're calling you that now. 
I know. I mean, honestly, everybody who's watching this, hashtag SPS has to be run trending. <laughs> Which it's is like amazing that we've come up with something new. Thank you, Picard Cast, for coming up with something new after 30 years. God bless. So I, I knew that Patrick was at the top of his game, and I, uh, I loved working with him. And then Marina had just closed in a play in the West End. I knew that her acting muscles were very strong, and I was a nervous wreck to come back as uh, Wild Bill Riker, Space Cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get that title this season, my friend. Excuse me, excuse me. I was the Space Cowboy. Oh. I was full of Davis. I was Durango. I was Durango the, what was it? Something Stranger, yeah. In a cowboy with the hat and everything. So, sod you lot, I was the cowboy. I think technically Steve Miller was the space cowboy, to be honest. But nonetheless, Mr. Dark, or you, you also, of course, I, Jerry referenced it to the Borg. And of course, Hugh very much was part of the Borg. I think for a lot of people, when the Borg became a part of the first season of Picard, it really, it really just hit home for them about how much these characters had meant to them. What was the most surprising reaction you had for the return of Hugh? It surprised me that there was that much love for the character, even though I, I knew it organically because I've been at conventions for so many years. Um, I, I was honestly surprised at the amount of love I got uh, and excitement and, and how, how, how the fans really craved to know how that adolescent character had evolved into a, into a man, you know? Um, and so that was surprising to me. It was very gratifying. They only bring back people that the, that the um, that guest stars that the people love, because yes. there are a whole slew of episodes that I couldn't name you the guest star if my life depended on it. <laughs> <laughs> but you were special. Yeah, you Thank know, you. and you yeah. were when you came on the show. It was a really special episode, and the fans loved you. And of mm. course, they're going to bring you back when there's a Borg story because you're it. Yeah, mm. you Thank and you, Jerry, sweetie. right? You're I it. appreciate that, Sir yeah. Patrick. So many people were surprised that you came back to play Picard. I know that you've talked about the reservations you've had. Now that the first season is completed, and you guys are eventually going to move into a second season once the world gets a little more normal again. What are your feelings now about having come back to the character? That I made the right decision. And it, it was entirely due to the people that I met at my first couple of meetings who were our producer writing team. I sat for more than two hours listening to them talk about their plans and how they wanted not just to revive Next Generation, but to illustrate the years that had passed and that the world was changed. And that's what excited me. And, and then um, the, the daily excitement was working with you guys and discovering this extraordinary range of talents that had been assembled um, because there is such diversity in our ensemble, that for probably the first five episodes, I was just awash with the, the satisfaction, the deep, profound satisfaction of working with you all. But he, he was also not the same man. Mm -hmm. He was a disappointed, sad, guilty, angry, possibly dangerous individual. So that was what absorbed me. As the season wore on, I began to feel, as I had begun to feel with Next Generation, that the character was actually inside me anyway. Hmm. And, and 20 years had passed for Patrick, P sorry, PCS, as much as it had. SPS. <laughs> SPS, you don't. I don't even know your own well, name. SS is, is some <laughs> sort of latex that you don't want to talk about on a channel you know like yeah. this. God, you're ancient. Could we, could we have an agreement about this? Because I have just taken on board a name that I was given about two years ago, very privately, by somebody in Second City in Chicago. Um, they called me P. Stew. Yeah, we like Peace Stew. That's the other name for you. Peace Stew is good. Peace Stew would be my choice. Okay, Peace Stew it is. Peace Stew it is. Well, we just have a few more minutes. I'd like to have some questions from fans. And this is a particular question. This is very moving. And this is from Chief Kala N32. This is for Brent and Patrick. 
what was it like to have the closure we never had for Data and Picard? Mm. It was the first time art had ever had such an impact on me like that. I cried. My father and I watched the two characters develop together, and I wish he could have seen it. So I wanted to ask the two of you what that was like. We had had closure of a sort in Nemesis. This was a different kind of closure. And um, uh, it's kind of a, a, a wonderful gift. In both cases, uh, we've had some of the greatest writers in the world write these two closures for us. And um, I, I'm utterly grateful for that. Working with someone I've known for 35 years and, and whom I love and discussing aspects of living that apply to both of us, Brent, I, I, I think we can say. And, and most importantly, learning from Data that his desire to be human had to include the knowledge and certainty that life was terminal, mm. that it would end, and it is the fact that it will end that makes living so important and living well and properly and appropriately and for society as much as for yourself. This is a question for Jerry oh and for Michelle. <clears throat> yes. Um, and this is from, I have to say, someone who really lucked out when they got their Twitter handle. It's from Starfleet Boy. Who wow. Oh, wow. Was, what is the one thing that you wish could be brought out of the Star Trek world, or universe, I guess, into the real world? <sighs> My gosh. God, uh, acceptance. Uh, inclusion. <laughs> inclusion. Um, yeah. that the, the, uh, literally what Patrick just said, you know, that the understanding of how valuable life is. Mm. Like, can we all look out for our brothers and sisters? Can we all just take the moment to understand that our differences are actually our strengths? Exactly. And it, what, it's what makes us um, a strong species, exactly. that we have all these different thoughts, these different looks, these different opinions, these different ways of, of, of handling ourselves in the world, of walking down the street. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful that I'm part of an organization that gets it. We always talk about Star Trek holding a mirror up to society. Perhaps society needs to look at us and start mm -hmm. um, replicating what we're doing mm -hmm. because we're trying to tell the stories to heal. Gene Roddenberry said in the 23rd century, there will be no sexism and no racism and no hunger and no greed. Let's make it happen. Well, let's hope we can and that every that child first century will know right how to now. read. Yep. And that every child will know how to Well, it's, uh, that's the key, isn't it? Education. Yeah. Exactly. Isn't it? Thank you guys so much. I can't think of a more perfect ending for this panel. Thank you. Make it Thank so. You. Bye, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye, guys. Bye. Peace, too. Bye. Thank you. As mentioned earlier in the panel, although we all came together for San Diego Comic-Con at home to talk about our respective Star Trek series, we are also here to support the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. CBS All Access has made a donation to the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund on behalf of the Star Trek universe on CBS All Access. Now, I know you're being pulled in a lot of directions and everyone is asking you to donate and people are stretched absolutely thin. If you have the means and should you choose, you can also support this important charity and cause. To do that, please visit NAACPLDF.org slash Star Trek United to donate today. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Well, thank you so much, Sir Patrick, for joining us. And thank you so much to the rest of the Picard cast for joining us as well. Now, that concludes our virtual Star Trek Universe panel at San Diego Comic-Con at home. Thank you for joining us.